Oh, it ripped off the the roof over there.
Do you think the CDC has your back on Ebola? Is this really as good as it gets? Justice told you two weeks ago, we need to have a travel ban. Now, more than 60% of Americans agree with me. That's after Ebola man welcomed into our country and our hospitals, infects at least two nurses, then dies, and then we get the bill. The question shouldn't be, should we have a travel ban? The question should be, why don't we have a travel ban? A ban, though, would have a negative political and economic consequences to Liberia. I don't know how to break this to you, Mr. President, but we Americans elected you. You were the president of the United States, not the president of the world. So when American lives are on the line, Political and economic consequences to other countries be damned. What do you think is the top leadership issue challenging our world today? Wow. I think the um, I, I think the top leadership issue challenging our world today is how, how to deal with a continuing growing population in the world and all the resource demands of places on the world.
but they can hit our embassy. And there are people with boots on the ground, not at the Pentagon, who are convinced that ISIS is preparing a complex assault on our embassy, meaning suicide vehicles, suicide vests. The same tactic, by the way, used in Mosul, Fallujah, and Ramadi. The ISIS field commanders are former Republican Guards officers. They know Baghdad. They've infiltrated over a thousand fighters into Baghdad's Sunni neighborhoods. And what we're now seeing are the probes and the rehearsals, and if you will, the reconnaissance for a major attack. Breaking news now, ISIS is now bragging, bragging that it has seized some of the weapons that the U.S. airdropped into Kobani, weapons that were meant to arm the Kurdish forces. The very latest Fox News national security correspondent, Jennifer Griffin, live at the Pentagon. Jennifer. Greta, CENTCOM acknowledged that at least one of the 28 bundles of ammunition, small arms, and medical supplies that U.S. warplanes airdropped Sunday to the Syrian Kurds fighting ISIS in Kobani ended up falling into ISIS-held territory. In fact, a press release yesterday said that U.S. warplanes carried out a follow-up strike, a follow-up airstrike to destroy that humanitarian aid drop so that it would not fall into the hands of ISIS. Then today, ISIS released this video that it says showed some of the aid the U.S. airlifted to the Kurds did land in its territory. The video, which is still being authenticated by the Pentagon, shows ISIS fighters inspecting crates of hand grenades and small arms similar to the munitions dropped by the U.S. warplanes. ISIS is using the alleged capture of some of the humanitarian relief for its own propaganda purposes. In fact, the fighters released tweets today with hashtags such as Thanks USA, attached to images of the arms which strayed into their territory in Kobani. That's the Syrian town on the Turkish border where all the fighting has been taking place in recent weeks. Pentagon officials say they can't rule out that the images are authentic and that some of the aid may have been captured by ISIS fighters. Overseas, ISIS militants now making another push now to seize territory in northern Iraq, launching more than a dozen coordinated simultaneous attacks over 24 to 48 hours, killing more than 60 people there. On the Syrian front, meanwhile, ISIS and Kurdish forces engaged in heavy, uh, heavy fighting today in Kobani. Plumes of smoke can be seen rising from inside that city, largely cut off from the ground. Greg Palcott live now from the Turkish-Syrian border with more. Greg. Bill, our quote of the day is, we are already using the weapons. That from a Kurdish official we spoke to just a couple of hours ago inside the embattled Syrian border town of Kobani. Behind me, this after that U.S. airdrop early Monday morning here of those guns and ammos and other supplies. It's pretty quiet right now in Kobani, but we have witnessed two major U.S. airstrikes during the day. They landed right in the center of the town. They landed right along the front line between ISIS and Kurdish defenders. We understand there were more overnight as well as a lot of clashes between ISIS and the Kurdish militia and two ISIS car bombs. That same Kurdish official told us the weapons are very useful. They include, remember, not just light weapons, but anti-tank weapons, and we believe mortars and grenades. That same official is saying he believes there'll be more airdrops coming up. Meanwhile, those Iraqi Kurdish Peshmerga fighters that Turkey yesterday said it would allow into the fight to cross the border, while well, we are told they haven't shown up yet. And you got to remember, not only obviously there are massive differences between the West and ISIS, there are differences between the Kurds and Turkey, and there are even squabbles between the various factions of the Kurdish people. Those reinforcements might be a long time coming. First, our top story right now, coalition airstrikes continuing to rain down on ISIS positions in Syria. Those attacks in continued support of those Kurdish fighters on the ground, specifically in Kobani, now apparently gaining the upper hand in the battle for that key Syrian border town. The latest word that we are getting from CENTCOM is there have been 
25 airstrikes against ISIS positions in the last 24 hours throughout this region. Two of those airstrikes hit in Kobani as the fight there continues. Our latest word from our contacts in the ground is that there have been street battles in the center of the town between the terrorists and the Kurdish militia. That is exactly where some had said that ISIS had been driven out. Sources do tell us that 20% of the town is still being held by ISIS. Amid reports of mounting casualties, the terrorists are also said to get more reinforcements. We just had word that they are planning yet another offensive on the town. Kurdish officials say they need more heavy weapons. that our neighbors, Canada, are hit by a terrorist attack, a radicalized Islamic convert murdering a Canadian soldier, running him over in the name of Allah. A second soldier was also hurt. On the record, is taking you to Canada with the Toronto Stars. Tonda McCharles joins us. Tonda, what happened? Greta, it, there, there are a lot of details emerging about this today. Uh, yesterday, Monday, in a small town called Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu, Quebec, south of Montreal, um, an individual named Martin, Martin Rouleau, uh, a guy who apparently became frustrated after his cleaning business uh, started to go badly, uh, con converted to, uh, I guess, a radical form of uh, Islam, and he uh, started to bring in some of his friends as well, tried to convert them. In any event, by June, he was uh, clearly angry, self-radicalized. His postings online caught the attention of the RCMP. His family became worried. They called the RCMP. Um, by July, it looked like he was making plans to go to Turkey. The RCMP foiled him in that, uh, arrested him, uh, seized his passport, but they didn't have enough evidence to prove that he was going abroad to commit a terrorist act. That's a criminal offense in Canada. In any event, the RCMP today says that they, neither they nor his family nor anybody foresaw what happened yesterday. But this guy essentially took his car, went to an area, a strip mall, where a lot of services are offered over the counter to uh, military vets, a lot of soldiers in the area. Uh, there's a training college down there. He waited for about two hours, apparently, the police tell us, in wait in his car. And when he saw a couple of soldiers, one in uniform, uh, emerge, he um, gunned his car toward them and ran them down, hitting them. One has died of his injuries. This is Canada's War Memorial. It's in the center of uh, the city of Ottawa. Right now it's all completely cordoned off, but yesterday gunman was able to approach uh, very close to where the two guards uh, were standing, took out his gun and shot one of the guards, Nathan Cirillo, to death. Witnesses say at least four shots were fired, then the gunman headed for the parliament, which is very close nearby. A number of people tried to save Nathan Cirillo's life, performing CPR, but it was too late. In newly released surveillance video, you see the gunman running from a car after shooting Nathan Cirillo. Pedestrians see the gunman approach and run away. Once through the front gates of Parliament, he hijacks a car. You can see the driver running away. Then, chased by police, he heads toward the main Parliament building. The gunman ran up these steps uh, and then through this main uh, entrance. <laughs> advanced down this way and that's what, what led to the second round of gunfire at the end where the suspect uh, so was the police gunned were down. advancing down down yeah, this direction they were and the rooms where the uh, ministers of parliament were caucusing and where the prime minister were that's down on these that's these the rooms right here yeah on the left here would have been the conservatives that's the governing party the prime minister was in that room from the, from your vantage point when you were here could you see shots being fired yeah we saw there was uh, there were several people shooting as we've seen it reported that kevin vickers the sergeant at arms was the guy that downed him. I, I can't say that I, I saw that. All I saw was a lot of people firing. My fellow Canadians, 
For the second time this week, there has been a brutal and violent attack on our soil. Today, our thoughts and prayers are with the family and friends of Corporal Nathan Cirillo of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders. Corporal Cirillo was killed today, murdered in cold blood, as he provided a ceremonial honor guard at Canada's National War Memorial. That sacred place that pays tribute to those who gave their lives so that we can live in a free, democratic, and safe society. Likewise, our thoughts and prayers remain also with the family and friends of Warrant Officer Patrice Vincent, who was killed earlier this week by an ISIL-inspired terrorist. Tonight, we also pray for the speedy recovery of the others injured in these despicable attacks. Fellow Canadians, we've also been reminded today of the compassionate and courageous nature of so many Canadians, like those private citizens and first, first responders who came to provide aid to Corporal Cirillo as he fought for his life. And of course, the members of our security forces in the RCMP, the City of Ottawa Police, and in Parliament, who came quickly and at great risk to themselves to assist those of us who were close to the attack. Fellow Canadians, in the days to come, we will learn more about the terrorist and any accomplices he may have had. But this week's events are a grim reminder that Canada is not immune to the types of terrorist attacks we have seen elsewhere around the world. We are also reminded that attacks on our security personnel and on our institutions of governance are by their very nature attacks on our country, on our values, on our society, on us Canadians, as a free and democratic people who embrace human dignity for all. But let there be no misunderstanding. We will not be intimidated. Canada will never be intimidated. In fact, this will lead us to strengthen our resolve and redouble our efforts and those of our national security agencies to take all necessary steps to identify and counter threats and keep Canada safe here at home just as it will lead us to strengthen our resolve and redouble our efforts to work with our allies around the world and fight against the terrorist organizations who brutalize those in other countries with the hope of bringing their savagery to our shores. They will have no safe haven. Well, today has been, without question, a difficult day. I have every confidence that Canadians will pull together with the kind of firm solidarity that has seen our country through many challenges. Together, we will remain vigilant against those at home or abroad who wish to harm us. For now, Lorene and Ben and Rachel and I join all Canadians in praying for those touched by today's attack. May God bless them and keep our land glorious and free. Breaking tonight, one day after a lone wolf terror attack in Canada, a man suspected of terror ties here attacks police with a hatchet in New York City. The attack happened in broad daylight this afternoon. Authorities are investigating a possible terror connection now, as Fox News has learned that the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force is on the scene. One officer's arm was reportedly sliced open. Here's the video. And there you can see, and the other officer was struck in the head. Both officers are now in the hospital. One is in critical condition. Police opened fire on the man, killing him and wounding a woman nearby with errant gunfire. She is said to be okay. Our cameras captured a picture of the attacker after it was all over. We have blurred that image. He is on the ground dead. This is the suspect you are seeing. He had a long beard on the ground. He had a long beard. He was wearing a dark green jacket. And the picture tells the story uh, as you see him wielding that hatchet as he goes after four cops, two of whom he wounded. But police now tell Fox the suspect's Facebook page has some very concerning content, including a statement that says, quoting here, the solution is to fight, armed struggle, simple. Then another statement that seems to support homegrown attacks, saying again, quoting here, helicopters, big military will be useless on their own soil. They will not be able to defeat our people if we use guerrilla warfare, attack their weak flanks. If you get wounded, who cares? If you die, who cares? Eventually they will surrender and then the war will be over.
Uh, we are here to discuss the apprehension of a suspect who is in the custody of the Hammond Police Department. This initially started with a murder in the city of Hammond at Motel 6. After um, going to the scene and finding Africa Hardy uh, dead, the Hammond Police Department began an investigation which led them to a suspect who was here in the city of Gary. After apprehending that person, they in turn began questioning him and learned uh, that there were additional victims and uh, he led them to the bodies of those victims. On uh, late Friday, early, uh, or late Saturday, early Sunday, he led them to three bodies. One of those individuals was identified as Anna Jones, a person who had been reported missing approximately 10 days ago in the city of Gary. The other two bodies' uh, identities have not been confirmed at this time. Overnight, he led to three additional bodies, two who were in one location, one in another location, and these bodies were in fact located in the uh, city of Gary in abandoned buildings here in the city of Gary. Teen-year-old could face the death penalty after prosecutors say he confessed to killing his family so he could pay off a loan shark. Investigators say this man, Alan Ruby, admitted he stole his father's handgun, then shot his mother, shot his father, and shot his 17-year-old sister. This was last Thursday in their home south of Oklahoma City. The police say the family's housekeeper found their bodies four days later. Listen to the 911 call she made. All three of them are laying down on the floor in the kitchen. I think they're dead. They're ice cold. Ugh. According to prosecutors, the son said he owed a loan shark $3,000, so he killed his entire family to inherit the estate. Prosecutors also said that the dad was going to cut him off financially because the teen couldn't control his spending. According to court documents, he took a trip to Dallas with friends soon after murdering his entire family, and he and his buddies reportedly stayed at a five-star hotel and watched Oklahoma beat Texas on Saturday. Yesterday, a judge ordered the suspect held without bail. He did not enter a plea. All right, thanks, Tucker. Well, the latest twist to spiking candy could potentially turn this Halloween into a real fright night for parents and children. That's because there are concerns that pot-tainted candy could make its way in your children's trick-or-treat bags. The problem is, is that some of these products look so similar to candy that's been on the market that we've eaten as children that there's really no way for a child or a parent or anybody, even an expert in the field, to tell you whether or not a product is infused. Really? Well, that was actually a PSA from the Denver Police Department. So what should you be looking out for? Joining us now is parenting expert Erica Katz. Nice to see you this morning. Good to see you. All right, so this is really a concern? I mean, we've heard about these sort of myths of what it will appear in children's Halloween candy going back to the 70s with all sorts of weird things popping in. We need to check our apples and things like that. But this seems to be concerning police. Well, it's very concerning because the gummy bears that are laced with pot look like actual gummy bears. So if your child eats one, which they probably would eat ten, they could eat. They could get very sick from it. All right, I have a keen eye here, but my kids wouldn't see this. So I can see that the one on the right, it looks translucent, so you can see, you can see light through it. So that's probably not the, the pot gummy bear. The one on the left, screen left, is the pot gummy bear. That's hard to tell. Well, the bigger concern to me is if a teen gives a gummy bear to another teen and they just eat it out of their hand, they don't know, thinking that it's real candy, that it could actually be a pot gummy bear. And then if they eat 10 or 15, think how sick they could get. It could be lethal. Okay, so you brought some items in here. Yes, what are we looking at here? 
So one of the things I like to tell parents, if you're going around with your younger ones and you're chaperoning, have them use a small little jar like this and then bring a bigger bag. So then when they go trick-or-treating and they take all that candy, you can then dump it into the bigger bag. So here's the bigger bag. Right. And then you have a lot of control because even if they want to eat candy as they're going house to house, you can take it out of the bag and hand it to them. And then you can make sure it's wrapped. So if it's something like a gummy bear, over here we have gummy bears that are wrapped, you know that those are safe. You just don't want them eating loose candy or going into someone's home, sticking their hand in a bowl, especially in a place like Colorado where they could have a bowl of candy. Do people put this out anymore? Or haven't we learned our lesson? You city, they don't, but what if somebody's hand. having a party at their house, an adult Halloween party, it could be there right on the counter. With some candy corn. So some other tips that you uh, provided with us this morning for kids. Make sure you tell your kids to wait until you eat candy when they get home, right? Yes, you want them to eat the candy at home. Of course, that's not always so easy. So make sure you hand them the candy yourself so that it's wrapped. You also want candy that is from a manufacturer that you know you don't want some strange manufacturer you've never heard of also those twisty candies like the blow pops you want to be careful of those because sometimes those can be opened um, what about homemade candies definitely no homemade candies because you don't know what's in them plus you don't know what's in their kitchen if your child has food allergies I would stay away from homemade candy so the the the, fa the the family that used to make the popcorn balls down the street from us avoid those yeah not cool Everybody, Fox News alert now as you wake up now. There are new reports claiming the Obama administration is quietly planning to grant work permits to up to 11 million illegals. Waiting on immigration reform? Maybe not so fast. Good morning, everybody. I'm Bill Hemmer. Uh, welcome here to America's Newsroom. We'll see where this goes. Huh? Good morning, Bill see Hemmer. You. Good morning, everybody at home. I'm Martha McCallum. So with millions of Americans still out of a job, President Obama's plan would reportedly allow employers to legally hire millions of foreigners, as well as giving them, quote, permanent resident cards. So Peter Ducey on the story leading us off in Washington with the tales now. How did we find out about this first off, Peter? Bill, there's a website where the government lists jobs for contractors to bid on, and one big project posted to this website last month, or rather this month in the last few weeks, is soliciting bids for a company to print a minimum 4 million permanent resident cards, or green cards, with some employment authorization documentation cards mixed in. That would be every year for five years. Plus, and this is the key, the company needs to be able to print uh, more than double that order at a moment's notice. There's this one paragraph in a 65-page long solicitation that says this, quote, the contractor shall demonstrate the capability to support potential surge in PRC and EAD card demand for up to 9 million cards during the initial period of performance to support possible, Im possible future immigration reform initiative requirements. Now, these cards themselves must have radio frequency ID embedded in a polycarbonate body that features holograms, and by the time the contract is over, the government is looking for 34 million of them. Uh, that's a lot. Uh Thank you. 